Good afternoon, viewers. Uh, this is Dr. Ron Grabowski. I'm the Director of Clinical Nutrition and Education for SpectraCell, and I'm here today to introduce you, as you can see, to SpectraCell testing. We're going to start out with the micronutrient testing today. Uh, however, over the next few weeks, we are going to uh, review some of the other testing that SpectraCell offers, including cardiometabolic, We'll do thyroid. We're also going to do telomere, and once again, uh, additional testing besides that. And the object over the next several weeks is to show you how the micronutrient test really ties into other testing procedures. Some of them are very common tests that you're familiar with, and some of them are once again are going to be new. However, <clears throat> today we're going to talk about the micronutrient test and show you a little background on the micronutrient test and how this test differs from other testing out there. Most of the testing that you and I have been trained on in our education have uh, been what we call static testing, which means like if you check someone's potassium or you check someone's magnesium, they were with serum testing, and once again, that's what's happening at that moment. And SpectraCell micronutrient test is a long-term testing type of procedure that is very similar to the hemoglobin A1C in the manner that it is looking back several months into that person's uh, nutritional status. As you know, the hemoglobin A1C looks back three to four months because of the red blood cell lifespan. And this micronutrient test actually looks um, back about six to nine months. Now, in regards to this testing, what cell are we looking at? In the micronutrient testing, Dr. Shive discovered that it was the lymphocyte, and specifically the T lymphocyte, that he chose to look at to see how this particular test um, correlates with your nutritional status and other tissues. And I'll get into that a little further. However, one of the things that sometimes clinicians come across is when they do this test, they wonder why this testing uh, takes several weeks to get the results. And once again, it usually will take three to four weeks for your office to receive the results. And the reason why this happens is there's several steps that have to be achieved initially. And by the time they test all the nutrients that they're looking at and put the report together and send it to you, it comes out about three weeks. Well, once again, so looking back on what cell we're looking at, why the lymphocytes? And so Dr. Shive, this is one of the reasons, or some of the reasons, I should say, that he picked the lymphocytes. As you know, the lymphocytes make up anywhere from about 20 to 40 percent of the t total white blood cell count in the body, where the neutrophils, of course, make up anywhere from about 50 to 70 percent, but they are very short-lived. And then, of course, the monocytes only make up about 5 to 10%. Uh, the eosinophils, as you know, about 1 to 3%, and then the basophils, about 0 to 2%. So when you look at the number of cells, you want to have a large enough number to look at, but at the same time, you want to have a cell that has a long enough lifespan to give us a long-term reading. And that's really what uh, we're looking at this particular cell. And you can see these are some bullets that outline why um, the lymphocytes were chosen by Dr. Shive, the creator of this technology at University of Texas, and how this could correlate. Now, when the uh, lab at SpectraCell receives a sample, day one of the testing, this is really what is going on. So they take the patient's sample and they are isolating the lymphocytes. And you can see here that uh, based on a couple of bullets, it mentions that it talks about being uh, introduced to a patented culture media. So it is a special media that Dr. Shive developed that found how to isolate the lymphocytes and how to incubate and grow these lymphocytes. And if you need further detailed clarification of this technology, I'd, re I'd really recommend that you send an email uh, or have set up a consult with um, probably Dr. Jacobson or one of the uh, researchers at uh, SpectraCell to get real detailed uh, 
clarification of the technology. But once again, I want to give you a basic outline of what is going on and why it takes a while to get the results. On day two and three, you can see that this is where we uh, have mitogen stimulation and growth of the uh, cells, and we are trying to see how the cells respond uh, with this mitogen stimulation. And once again, the interesting thing, if you look down at the fourth bullet, what I think is very unique about the testing compared to other labs, is a lot of times when labs are testing an individual uh, and some type of lab test, that they will usually double check it if there's an abnormality. And you can see in this particular testing that each nutrient test is performed in triplicate. So we are doing a testing of three times to make sure that the results are valid, which is, once again, very unique compared to other labs out there, whether it's a standard testing or <clears throat> other labs that are doing a unique type of test. Then, of course, you can see on day four, there's this uh, 3-H thymidine incorporation, and they're more or less tagging the new cell growth by this radioactive marker, and then they, once again, determine the new cell growth from the, from the original cells. And so they're really seeing what happened from the time they received the cells, they isolated the cells, they grew the cells, and now they're isolating these cells. Then on day five, they look at the growth response, and you can see this is where they start to determine the deficiencies through metabolic response compared to the control media. And they continue this process for the next few days to look at each of the nutrients that are on the micronutrient test. And once again, if you think about this process, the first five days are very fragile or very unique and technical and, and makes them you know, different compared to a lot of different uh, tests out there. So when other labs out there say they do the same technology, they do not do the same technology. They may pull a particular cell out of a sample and look at it, but are they really stimulating the growth? Are they looking at the isolation of a T lymphocyte that has about a three to nine month growth rate? And we'll talk about that a little bit more as I go down through the um, lecture today, but the point is that we are looking at a very unique cell that is looking long-term evaluation. This is not a snapshot of a person's nutritional status. This is what has been going on for at least the last three to nine months and for the most part about six months. <clears throat> so when we look at, of course, a person's nutritional status, one of the things that I think is very important to keep in mind is what affects that person's nutritional status. Now, these are a few pointers that are indicating of the possibility of the patient's results, but at the same time, I think what's really important about this is these are just a few. I mean, it could be absorption, it could be, once again, drug nutrient interaction like this is talking about, or it could be just what medications are doing to an individual. We could look at genetics. Of course, when we look at these particular variables, we have to kind of break them down into what we call modifiable and non-modifiable. Of course, the modifiable would be the diet, the exercise, the sleep, somewhat modifiable with the medications, depending upon what medication a person is taking. What I mean by that is they could be taking a prescription uh, anti-inflammatory or an over-counter anti-inflammatory, so the dosage may make a difference. Of course, the person's previous medical history, do they have any history of diabetes? Do they have any history of cardiovascular disease? And one of the things that's unique I think about this testing, and I'll point this out when we get into the micronutrient test, is how many possibilities and what combinations we're looking at to really see what is going on with this patient before maybe they took medication, while they're on medication, or were they able to change their medication dosage or even the type of medication based on their biochemistry. The other thing, of course, as I mentioned, genetics. Genetics comes into play in regards to non-modifiable. And so what I mean by that is if a person, for example, performs a MTHFR, which we'll talk about in the future, 
and a person is looking to take in certain nutrients and they may be affected by that particular enzyme, is how is that going to affect them down the road and are there certain nutrients, are there certain dietary restrictions or types of diets that should be avoided or encouraged if a person has a particular type of genetic uh, makeup. And as you all know, it's getting to be very popular today in regards to what people are looking at uh, to determine a person's overall health, whether it's a nutritional status, whether it's medications, or some other type of intervention. So when we're looking at patient's history, once again, it comes up. And the interesting thing I think you'll find, especially in this case um, that we're going to show today and when you're interpreting or evaluating these reports is how deficient or borderline levels really affect someone's outcome. And a lot of times, and I can tell you this from using this test for 25 years, that there are a lot of times where I will look at a test and say to that patient, do you have any family history of diabetes? Do you have any family history of GI problems? Do you have any family history of autoimmune? And they go, oh, yeah, Dr. Brusk, I forgot to tell you that. I have that condition in my family or another condition. And it's pointed out by this particular test. So this micronutrient test should not just be used for pathologies, but should also be used for wellness. I think that's a huge part that we really want to emphasize to our patients is this testing could pick up something at a very early stage. And I'll give an example. I had a patient in this morning that I was going over her results, and she mentioned to me after I told her that this testing was indicating to her that um, she's going down the road towards type 2 diabetes. She says, it's funny you said that because I was just at my doctor's last week, and he said to me that my HbA1c is going up, so I'm going towards diabetes. And so the standard test that we've all been trained on, the HbA1c, was further confirmed by this patient's micronutrient test today in my office. Now, there are a lot of things that affect the HbA1c, which I'll point out in this particular uh, report today. But the, the main thing that I want to emphasize to you today is how to interpret this test and what this test means to you and why you can't just look at the front cover of this report and say, I need to give that particular product or another product or a combination product, that there's so many variables that come into play that we will slowly build on from this week to the next several weeks. And we're going to talk about different pathologies over the next few months. Uh, so some of you have specialties out there, whether it's endocrinology or cardiology and internal medicine or dermatology. We're going to try to bring all of those to the surface to show you how the literature really corresponds with this testing. But it specifically gets to the point of customizing nutritional therapy. And before I get into the test, I just want to make a point that I've been doing this for 35 years as far as the nutritional uh, consulting <clears throat> with my patients. And it hasn't been until the last 25 years, of course, that I've been using SpectraCell because of that's how long it's been available. But from 35 years ago to 25 years ago, I was guessing. We were using serum testing. We were using urinalysis and things like that, which was not giving us a very clear picture on what we really need to be looking at. And this test definitely does. So let's get into some of the testing. So like I mentioned, this is a micronutrient test. And when you perform this test on a patient, you will, of course, see that this front page breaks down into two portions. The first part of this test talks about functional deficiencies. Those functional deficiencies mean that this patient's cells, the patient's lymphocytes, do not have enough of this nutrient or nutrients to really function at optimal level. And then if you look below that, you will see that there's a section that says borderline deficiencies. Now, these borderline deficiencies, this was introduced about maybe five to seven years ago. And what they found out or what we found out through data uh, collecting is that patients had 
indications of a particular deficiency, but yet that particular deficiency was not in the deficient status on this report. It was actually close to being deficient, but it wasn't there yet. And the same thing happens in our clinics today, that we see patients that may not have a so-called low TSH, but it's a borderline TSH, or the same thing with the HbA1c, it's not a ab, it's not a significantly abnormal A1c, but it's getting close. Like if you have a value of an HbA1c to be under 5.6 and a person has a 5.7, we say, well, you're not diabetic yet, but your HbA1c is climbing up and it's going towards hyperglycemia. So that's the way you want to look at these borderline values is that the patient's not there yet, but it definitely is affecting their some of their signs and symptoms. And I can tell you from using this test for several years that you will find that to be true, that a lot of the borderlines play a large role with the patient's signs and symptoms. And so that's why spectra cell splits them up. We don't want you to just look at the true deficient states or the functional deficiencies, but we want you to look at the borderline deficiencies as well as the functional deficiencies. And once again, we'll talk about the coverage or treatment or interaction of this particular uh, individual as far as a sample. So there are two things on this test that clinicians often ask about, and one of them is called the Spetrox, and the other is called the Immunodex. The Immunodex used to actually be called the LPI, and that stood for Lymphocyte Proliferation Index, but now it's called the Immunodex. And the Immunodex is actually like the first five days of growth. And as a result, this is part of that initial slides that I was showing you on by the time they collect the cells, they separate the cells out, and they put in the mitogen stimulation, and of course, go from there. And so at that point, what you're looking at is how did the cells respond in that particular media? And so the immunodex, but in general, what you also want to think about is what nutrients affect the person's immune system. So any nutrient that has immunological function can actually affect this immunodex. Now this particular graph on this slide shows you that that patient is reported in the yellow, and that would be a borderline deficiency or borderline finding. We want to try to get the person's square up to the white. And once again, if you've been using SpectraCell, you are very familiar with what your goals are and how you want to get them up there. If you're new to SpectraCell, then once again, you want to take that patient's report, result and move it to the white. I personally like the patient's square to be in the mid-white of all the graphs. And once again, we'll talk about that. So in essence, this person's results could show you that their immune system isn't real strong and you could probably predict that they are going to get sick more frequent in the future or they have been getting sick frequently in the past. And now your job is to correlate how the findings on this test, which we'll get to in a minute, actually relate to this person's immune system. Because if I said to you right off the start that I have a patient that immune system is subpar. What would you do for that patient? And most people out there today would say, well, I would give them vitamin C or I might give them zinc. But what happens if I told you, oh, their vitamin C status is normal or their zinc status is normal? Then what would you do? And most of us, or most people would sit there and hesitate for a minute and say, well, I'm not sure what I would do then. But this particular test is going to show you how it correlates with that and how you customize a person's treatment by looking at a general marker like the Immunodex, but specifically looking at nutrients that support the immune system. Now, the Spetrox, this graph next to the Immunodex, is telling you about the person's overall antioxidant status. How can their body quench the free radicals in their body? What's their capability? 
what antioxidant status does this patient have that is going to be able to handle, once again, the free radicals? So any nutrient that has antioxidant qualities will affect this. Now, I can tell you this from doing this for several years, that both of these markers, both of these graphs, the immune index and the spectrox, are very, very difficult to maintain in the white if people are on a lot of medication, if people are exercising heavily or regularly, I should say not necessarily heavily, but regularly, and if someone has had a major illness, whether it's diabetes, whether it's cardiovascular disease or something like that. I'm not saying it can't be achieved. I'm just saying that there are so many nutrients that can affect both of these graphs that you're going to see these fluctuate on a retesting procedure, whether it's retesting in six months or a year. Now, before I forget, I want to mention this because one of the things that comes up when I'm usually doing consults for SpectroCell is, well, Dr. Broski, how often can I do this test? Well, as I mentioned, the lymphocyte has a lifespan of about three to nine months. However, when I first started using this test, I started to retest at about three months. And I found out that after three months, there wasn't much change with the lymphocyte, even though they were taking supplementation. And so now I do it twice a year. I do it about every five to six months. So the retesting, and you'll see, based on some of the information I'm going to give you today, the retesting is very, very important. And the reason why it is, is because you can throw some imbalances. And I'll talk about some of those imbalances today. And then over the next several weeks and months, I'm going to further clarify why you need to reevaluate on a regular basis to make sure that you're not causing some problems, even though you're trying to resolve or solve some problems. And that's one of the things that I can't overemphasize enough. For those of you that are clinicians that can, that have prescription rights, I'll give you a quick example, is what happens if a person came into your office and had high cholesterol? And you said, well, we're going to put you on a statin, and that's great, and we know statins work. And you put them on a statin, and you're going to say, okay, well, I'm going to put you on a statin. Goodbye, good luck. I hope that you know, works for you. And never retest them? Of course not. You're going to retest their cholesterol levels or cardiovascular risk levels over the next several months or year. You don't just put someone on medication and hope that things work out and guess that it's working. The same thing is true with this particular testing, is that once you determine what the patient's deficient is and how they correlate with the person's signs and symptoms, how are you going to monitor these people to make sure that not only are you going to try to resolve or decrease the severity of their condition, but make sure you're not causing another condition. Because we all know like certain medications cause deficiencies and certain medications cause other signs and symptoms. So now we're going to move on to the main part of the test. And once again, this particular test um, has numerous nutrients involved with it. And you're going to see, as you saw just like with the Spetrox Immunodex, that each graph has three colors to it. The top part is white, the middle part is yellow, and then the lower section of each graph is light blue or teal, whatever color you'd want to say that is, but it's, it's definitely more towards a light blue. Now, the light blue is deficient, the yellow zone is borderline, and of course the white zone is adequate. Now, if the patient's square is in the white, it's green. If it's in the yellow, it turns black. And if this person's square hits the blue, it turns red. So I tell all my patients, I don't want any red squares and I don't want any black squares. And the reason I don't want that is because I don't want any borderlines and I definitely don't want any deficiencies with these particular individuals. So taking that into consideration, <clears throat> you can see that on this front page, or first page, uh, of the graphs that there are some there's a black square and there's several red squares now the little crosses that make up the gray etching on each graph represents the last 3500 to 4000 patients 
Now, you are not compared to those patients. The patients are not compared to those. Once again, they're compared to a control. But it gives you an idea of where a lot of people fall. But you don't really know if these, if the people that the last 4,000 patients were ill. You don't know if they were just doing this for wellness, or you don't know if there was a lot of medication involved. So it's hard to really take that gray etched area and make anything out of it besides the width of each of the gray area tells you that more people fall into that particular area. As you can see from this, the person's B vitamins are pretty good, except for the person's B3 is in boy. There you can see that their uh, results are getting close to touching the yellow. If you go down to the next row, you will see that asparagine is touching the yellow as far as that person's square, and it turned black. Then you go to the far right of that row, and you'll see oleic acid. That person's results are in the blue, and so that square is red. Then if you go, <clears throat> excuse me, if you go to the bottom row, you'll see that the bottom row has numerous red squares. Now, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that's really unique about this test over the years of using it is we have found patterns or certain nutrients that come into play that shows us or directs us towards a certain system, whether it's the gastrointestinal, whether it's the nervous system, whether it's the liver, whether it's the gallbladder, or maybe musculoskeletal, something like that. The bottom row on this particular page, I, and this is just in my personal office, I tell my patients it's the osteoporosis or the osteoarthritis row. And the reason I say that is because every one of these nutrients in this row, starting from vitamin D3 all the way over to magnesium, has been supported in the literature for osteopenia, osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, muscle cramps, you know, trigger points, <clears throat> muscle, uh, and, and some type of uh, myalgia, muscle, like I said, mild, muscle pain, or even fibromyalgia. <clears throat> and so when you see these nutrients in this bottom row affected, you have to ask yourself, how does this correlate to my patient's signs and symptoms that they came into. But one of the big keys with this page is above that row. And as I mentioned, there's a lot of interactions that happen with medications. There's a lot of interactions that happen with nutrients. In the middle row there, at the very end, to the far right, you see oleic acid is deficient. Now, through the years, we have seen that when oleic acid is deficient or borderline, that it has a huge impact on the bottom row. Now, I can't tell you why this happens, but I can tell you this is of highest frequency. Whenever oleic acid is abnormal, once again, abnormal to me is in the yellow or blue zone, we will often see one of these three nutrients involved. We either see vitamin D3 is in dog, we'll see calcium and or zinc involved. So you can see that this patient's results correlates very well with that tendency or that trend. Now, what we think happens, or what I think happens, is that the oleic acid being an omega-9, not omega-3, but an omega-9, has an impact on every cell membrane in the body. And how that cell membrane integrity is determines how the nutrients go in and out of the cell. And what's interesting about this is it seems that the fat-soluble nutrients and or minerals get affected the most. And so if you look in this, you can see that vitamin D gets involved, vitamin A is involved, vitamin K is normal, manganese is normal, but then the next four minerals to the right of that, the calcium, the zinc, the copper, and magnesium are all involved. So if you try to correct that bottom row by each of those nutrients, once again, let's start with vitamin D. You gave someone vitamin D3, and you said, I know this dosage is probably 5,000 international units. That should take care of it. And you retest the person 
in six months, and their vitamin D moved up a little bit but wasn't resolved. But you forgot to look at the oleic acid because if you didn't correct the oleic acid, you wouldn't correct the vitamin D3 or you would have a difficult time correcting it just like the magnesium, the zinc, the copper, and so on. So one of the things you want to keep in mind, and this is through repetition of using this test and seeing the trends, and like I said, I've seen this trend over and over and over, and we're going to correlate some of these nutrients with diabetes or with hyperglycemia in the future. And this is a good example that if someone handed me this result and said, what do you think is going on with this patient? I would say either this person has a strong family history of diabetes or they personally have a history of hyperglycemia, diabetes, and or hypoglycemia. But it would definitely be a strong indicator for glucose abnormalities. And once again, I'll get into that in a second and why I say that. But the point is that we have to address the oleic acid if we are going to try to correct that bottom row. Okay, now I'm going to move on to the next page of the report and talk about that. But I'm going to come back. I'm going to be flipping back and forth and talking about how some of these nutrients correlate with one another and how they correlate, once again, with the literature. So the next page, of course, second graph page, shows you <clears throat> that there are there's a box of three graphs, and it says carbohydrate metabolism. This particular box tells us about fructose sensitivity. There's one graph that says glucose-insulin interaction, and there's another graph, of course, that says chromium. Now, the fructose sensitivity is not a graph indicating that necessarily that a person is consuming a lot of fructose. What this graph is indicating is whether or not this person metabolizes f fructose properly. So once they get it inside the cell and they're trying to bring fructose into glycolysis is how is this being performed? Is it being performed efficiently? And according to this graph on this particular patient, this patient metabolizes fructose extremely well. Now, the person could be, if it was abnormal, it could be a problem where the person's consuming a lot of fructose, or it could be another nutrient that's causing them not to metabolize fructose properly. And I'll get into that in a little bit. The next graph to that is the glucose-insulin interaction. And this graph tells us, is there some insulin resistance? Is it where this patient's insulin receptors are not working efficiently? So once again, this patient may come to you and say that, no, I don't have diabetes. I haven't been diagnosed with diabetes, but I have two family members that have diabetes. So I have two family members that have hypoglycemia, or I have tendency for hypoglycemic tendencies. So that would give you an indication that, once again, that you're going to have to address that. And I'm going to show you how we're going to do that here in a second. <clears throat> the next graph to that is chromium. Now, chromium, as you know, is important for insulin receptors. It is not important for fructose because fructose doesn't need insulin to get into the cell. So if the person has an abnormal chromium, it could definitely affect the glucose-insulin interaction, but doesn't necessarily have to affect the, uh, or it won't affect the fructose sensitivity. But we're going to come back and talk about what nutrients do affect that glucose-insulin and how this is a good example. This is an actual report. This report was not made up. This is an actual report that was done at SpectraCell and has been correlated with the person's history and how they have a tendency for glucose abnormalities. Now, the spectrox, as I mentioned on the previous slides, tells us about antioxidants. Now, the row below that talks about individual antioxidants. And these individual antioxidants, you can see, are all normal except for three of them. Three of them are borderline. Now, these three borderlines, the glutathione, the CoQ10, and the vitamin C, as you know, are all, have all 
antioxidant qualities. And those antioxidant qualities are going to be reflected in the spectrox. So in order for you to correct that spectrox, you're definitely going to have to correct or improve this person's individual antioxidants in regards to glutathione, CoQ10, and vitamin C. But those aren't the only ones, and I'm going to show you some other ones that come into play. Then on the bottom of that page, you look at the immunodex, and you see that the immunodex is in the bottom portion of the yellow. So once again, it's not in good status. Well, then you have to ask yourself, okay, so what nutrients affect the person's immune system? Well, one of the nutrients that affects the immune system that's on this page is vitamin C. So if we push up vitamin C, theoretically, I should start to improve the immunodex. If I improve the glutathione, CoQ10, and the vitamin C, I should theoretically improve the person's spectrox. Because once again, any nutrient, whether it's a precursor or an actual antioxidant, has an effect on the spectrox. And any nutrient that has immunological function technically should affect the immunodex. Okay? Now I'm going to turn to the next page where there's numbers, but I'm going to come back to these two pages of graphs because I think they tell the most. So when you turn to this page, you will see that there's a bunch of numbers. And the, of course, it says patient results as far as that column, and it shows you the reference range. If you notice, the reference range is not micrograms, nanograms, milligrams per deciliter, or anything like that. It is percentage. It is percentage of growth. So it is based way back at the beginning of this lecture on the whole stimulation of the cells and when they do the mitogen stimulation and they see the potential growth of those cells and how they're responding according to these reference ranges. And so once again, that's what makes it unique about this. This is a functional test. We're looking to see how this person's cells, the lymphocytes, respond when they are challenged or put into a media that is either containing certain nutrients or lacking certain nutrients. And that's why this test used to be called, at the very beginning when spectral cell first started performing this test, it used to be called the FIA. And that stood for Functional Intracellular Analysis. Now, it is called the micronutrient test. But once again, it's a functional test. So you have been using functional tests for several years, and you don't even maybe realize it. For example, that if you've been doing HbA1c, that's a functional test. If you've used fructosamine, that's a functional test. If you've been looking at people's homocysteine, that's a functional test. So you've been doing other functional tests. You maybe just didn't realize that those are functional tests. On the other hand, if you do a serum B12 or you do serum folate or something like that, that's a static test, and that's just a snapshot of what's going on. So you can see here the ones that are highlighted in red here on this particular page is indicating to you that they're deficient. And these are the ones that are going to be red squares in the blue portion of the graph. However, if they have borderlines, and you'll see this in the future, the borderlines will also show up. They will not show up red, but they will say borderline in that column where it says functional <clears throat> or abnormals. Okay, so once again, this isn't showing that right now, but in, normally it will say borderline or deficient. Okay, so you compare that person's results. Once again, it's percent of control versus what the reference range is, and, and once again, percentage, not micrograms or milligrams, and that gives you the functional test. And that's what Dr. Scheib thought was very interesting and unique about this, is how is this person lymphocyte, more or less, status functioning with their present nutritional content. Is it borderline? Is it deficient? Is it abnormal? Is it sufficient for, once again, normal function? And how these cells, once again, correlate with other tissues. So now I'm going to go back to the graphs. 
And I'm going to go back to the first page of graphs and show you how, once again, this correlates. As I mentioned, the oleic acid correlates with the bottom row. But if you go back and you think about the spetrox, and I mentioned the spetrox is affected by those individual antioxidants, but on this page, if you look at this page and the spetrox, you'll notice that magnesium has antioxidant capabilities. Copper has antioxidant. Zinc has antioxidant. Your manganese has antioxidants. Your vitamin A has antioxidant qualities. Your vitamin D3 as in dog has antioxidant qualities. Your glutamine has antioxidant qualities. So all of these that I just read off there, in addition to those individual antioxidants, has an impact on spetrox. And because of that, you can see that if you don't get those results up to a good status, that it's going to affect the spetrox. And that's why the spetrox is so difficult to maintain. Because one or two of these nutrients that may be borderline or deficient are going to affect that. The same thing is true with the immunodex. Is how is the immunodex going to be affected? Well, it's going to be affected by any nutrient that has immunological function. We know zinc has immunological function. We know vitamin D3 has immunological function. We know that vitamin C has immunological function, so we have to address that. Now, as you can see, if you look at magnesium on this page, you will see that this person scored the worst of the last 4,000 patients tested for magnesium because they are in the bottom of that gray etching of the graph. So now, when you're that low, just from experience, I can tell you that it's going to take some time to get it up to the white, or it's going to take a larger dosage to get up to the white. And so as a, from a clinician standpoint, if a patient says, well, how long do you think it'll take before I start feeling better because there's magnesium deficiency or one of these other deficiencies? Well, if it's really deep in the blue, it's going to take several months, usually five, six months. If it's barely into the yellow, it may take one month. It may take two weeks. But the point is that you're going to show this patient, look, this didn't happen overnight. This is over the last six to nine months. And so it didn't take one or two days to make you depleted. It took several days to make you depleted. And so now you have to address it from that standpoint, is correlating that. Now, and we'll get into this over the next several weeks, but I want to point out here, you can see that calcium is low and magnesium is low. Both of them are functional deficient. We know that we don't give one with the other. Same thing with zinc and copper. We don't give zinc without copper or copper without zinc. And we know that vitamin D affects magnesium and vitamin D affects calcium and vice versa. So the point is that when you start supplementing them, if you just address, say, for example, on this particular page, if you just said, I'm going to give a calcium supplement, a magnesium supplement, zinc, copper, a vitamin A, a vitamin D, but I'm not going to give the oleic acid, the next time you test them, you may find out that you didn't correct all of them. And it may be, once again, because of oleic acid um, relationship. But say you did address the oleic acid, as you know, that's an omega-9, then you may also more easily affect the bottom row. But say you didn't affect that asparagine there. Asparagine, as you know, is a non-essential amino acid and has a high impact or relationship with immunology, whether it's allergies, whether it's autoimmune diseases, and I also see it correlate with cancers. It's not found in every cancer patient, but I've seen it in several cancer patients. Once again, I don't know if it's the chicken or the egg. Did the asparagine cause the cancer, or did the cancer cause the asparagine? Because when these people come to me, I'm testing them. I already know their diagnosis, so they've been diagnosed with a cancer. And then when we get the results, once again, it's related. But it could be a simple food allergen. It could be an airborne allergen, something like that that's causing the asparagine to be low. But it could also be zinc-related. Because zinc, as you know, makes a lot of enzymes that convert your non-essentials to essentials. And so the zinc being low, if the person consumes enough protein, that protein in their diet may be corrected with the assistance of the zinc, which then may correct the asparagine. So once again, those biochemical connections. Now, going back to this next page, and like I said, I'm going to be flipping back and forth, but I think it's very important that you see this now because next week we're going to correlate the cardiometabolic test with this test. 
is you can see that glucose-insulin interaction is abnormal. That glucose-insulin interaction that's abnormal, that's telling you that there's some insulin resistance problems. Now, based on the scientific literature, there are several nutrients that affect the glucose-insulin interaction or insulin receptors. One of them is chromium. Well, we know it's not chromium on this person because this person's chromium is adequate. If you go back to the previous page, you see magnesium. Magnesium affects the insulin receptor. So we know that this is one of the nutrients that I have to give this patient. Another nutrient that affects the glucose-insulin interaction is zinc, and you can see this person's zinc is abnormal. Another one is vitamin D3 is in dog, and you can see that's definitely real low. They almost bottomed out. Another one is niacin, or B3 is in boy. If you look across the B vitamins, which B vitamin is the closest to being abnormal? It's B3. And what's interesting about this case is the person's glucose insulin interaction is abnormal and B3 has an impact on that. So if I had to supplement or I had to direct my therapy to this patient, I would give them D3 is in dog, B3 is in boy, make sure they had zinc and magnesium adequate amounts to help correct the glucose insulin. Now, of course, I would uh, also address the calcium, the copper, and the oleic acid, but just relating it to the glucose insulin, it would be those nutrients that I would address. I wouldn't have to give this person chromium because they already have adequate chromium. So that's where people read something on diabetes or hypoglycemia. They say, oh, yeah, I read an article on diabetes and chromium. Well, I'm going to give this person chromium. Well, he, he or she doesn't need chromium because the chromium status is good. They need the zinc, the magnesium, the D3, and the B3. So that's how you more or less read this report and analyze it and show that there's some connections. And once again, SpectraCell has you know, consulting services. There's several consultants that can help you further learn this technique and analyze it or interpreting. And also that there's a lot of information on SpectraCell's website as far as nutrient relationships and diseases and how certain nutrient deficiencies correlate with certain pathologies. And this is a beautiful case of how this individual has, once again, either a high family history of diabetes or hypoglycemia, the patient has it, and or they're going in that direction of developing it. So you're going to catch it before it actually happens. So that's kind of a brief summary on how to interpret a micronutrient test, what you do with the zones. Once you start talking to more and more consultants, they'll direct you on how there's other relationships. But if there's some emphasis that I want to provide today when interpreting this test, is treat the yellow zones, the borderline zones, like the deficient zones. Another one is definitely retest these people. Don't just give them some therapy and say, go on, good luck, hope you feel better, because you may cause some interactions. And once again, we'll talk about those things in the near future and in the next few weeks. And the other thing is seeing nutrient-nutrient interactions. What nutrients have large impacts on other nutrients and of course, the nice thing is when these nutrients correlate with the scientific literature is how magnesium deficiency correlates with the glucose insulin interaction, how zinc correlates with it, how vitamin D3 correlates with it, how B3 correlates with it, and how you're customizing the person's therapy because of these results. You're not just throwing a bunch of supplements at these people and saying, good luck, I hope this feels better, or I hope you feel better, or I hope this helps with your condition, and you're guessing on what you're doing rather than having objective information like this saying, I know what's affecting your glucose insulin. I know what might be affecting your bones. I know what might be affecting your inability to correct the vitamin D3 in the serum. It might be the oleic acid. So with that said, I'm going to open up for a few questions and go from there. All right, well, according to the assistant director, 
she's telling me that <laughs> there are no questions at this time. So hopefully for those of you that listen to this uh, webinar in the future, that it introduces you to um, this particular technology, and I hope that you find this technology to be very beneficial for your patients. And have a good afternoon.